Hello, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the CMI webinar series designed for and by CMI. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the webinar process that uh, we are using today. First of all, um, most of these series are broadcast from Colorado School of Mines. Of course, amid COVID, we're broadcast from all over. But if you have a suggestion for a future webinar, we're always looking for topics that are uh, real pertinent to you and your work. So please um, don't hesitate to let us know what you're thinking about and uh, wanting to see. This is a public webinar and a recording is gonna be available next week at the aimslab.gov slash CMI. And it is under the workforce tab. So be sure to look for it there. And I want to also remind you that the presenter would like for you to hold questions till the end. That is that we'll be answering them at the end of the presentation. But I encourage you as soon as you have that question to go ahead and type it into the Q&A uh, place on your um, laptop or smartphone. It does take a while to get that um, question in, and that would be helpful to keep everything flowing if you would, um, as soon as you have that question, place it in the Q&A bar. I'd like to introduce our presenter today. And um, Dr. Ricky, he, Rickley is an associate professor in the Industrial and Systems Engineering Department at Wayne State University. He received his BS and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from um, Michigan Technical University Technological University and received his PhD in industrial and systems engineering from Virginia Tech. So at Wayne State, he has accomplished many things in particular, creating the manufacturing and remanufacturing systems laboratories. And um, his research thrusts include uncertainty management in remanufacturing and disassembly, leveraging data to innovate decision-making in the digital manufacturing enterprise, and collaborative robotic automation in advanced manufacturing and disassembly systems. And we're gonna hear more about that. I'd like to not take any more time from uh, Dr. Rickley. And so Jeremy, if you wouldn't mind taking it over from here, we're looking forward to your presentation. All right, thank you, Cynthia. Um, You're welcome. Really appreciate the opportunity uh, from CMI uh, to present during this webinar. Uh, the, the title of the webinar that I'm going to give today, uh, you can see on the screen, is Automated Electric Machine Dismantling with Collaborative Robotics. Um, and I'd like to spend some time at the beginning of the webinar talking about why focusing on electric machines, um, dismantling of electric, electric machines, why it's important to, to consider that process, uh, and then work that Wayne State has done uh, on the collaborative robotics side uh, to help improve uh, dismantling operations of electric machines. So uh, I wanna spend just a minute on, on electric machines. Uh, they're found in auto, automobiles and, and other uh, larger assemblies, uh, and they do contain rare earth magnets. So there is a supply of, uh, of this rare critical materials in electric machines in used products. Um, that can be collected, uh, distributed, and uh, sent back to recovery enterprises to be dismantled and to access that material. Uh, so that's the reason in, in uh, the remainder of the talk really focus on dismantling of electric machines. There's a source of, of critical materials in these devices that can be accessed. So how does this fit uh, within CMI? Um, and I'm gonna relate this to uh, some of CMI's main focuses, uh, developing substitutes, diversifying supply and driving reuse and recycling. Uh, so being able to access these end of use uh, components, end of use assemblies and extracting material uh, from these components helps diversify the supply of the critical material supply base, um, but also uh, drives reuse and recycling. Uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to expand on this a little bit more, a little bit more um, so we can really define and um, expand on what dismantling means. So I really want to, want to dive into driving reuse and recycling and what's involved with that process. Uh, and it really shows up in, in this stage of what I'll say, kind of the life cycle of, of a product uh, or material where we have extraction, processing components, end of use applications, and then it can be fed back into these stages during recycling and reuse. Um, 
But what happens here uh, in order to access the materials after the end of, end of use applications? And what are the steps that really need to be done to feed this material and these stocks back into the, these other uh, upstream sources? Uh, and that's where I want to expand on what recycling and reuse entails um, from the disassembly side and from disassembly research. Um, so on the, on the right here is a figure that tries to provide a little bit more detail into the recycling and reuse side and, and how to access components. So we have input supply, production and distribution and use. And then after end of use, we see discard or core collection. Uh, and core collection is the actual process of getting the use components back um, so that you can do a variety of different actions or end of life treatments with them, recycling, remanufacturing, reuse. Uh, and you'll see that if some can go directly to sorting and testing, uh, if the material, the component, uh, you know, if it's not a very large complex assembly, uh, it can go to sorting and testing, uh, or it does go up into disassembly to where the individual components of a larger assembly are removed, separated, uh, and then sorted and tested to see how the quality is, see what materials are there, uh, and what can be sent for cleaning and inspection, and then what has to be sent to disposal. So disassembly is, is a very key process within this whole system. Um, and it allows or is one of the first points of access to critical materials or critical components that can be fed back into the, the upstream activities. Um, even after disassembly, there are subsequent uh, steps that need to be followed, cleaning and inspection, fabrication, reassembly, and then testing. Um, but the focus as we go forward and the focus of Wayne State's work uh, was on disassembly. So what is disassembly? Uh, a quick definition to kind of get everyone on the same page uh, is a process of physically separating a product into its parts or subassemblies. Um, and it's had a rich history of research uh, in technologies, in planning and optimization for dis disassembly, uh, which we're using uh, in, in, uh, to mean it, it, the same thing as dismantling here in the rest of this work. <clears throat> so what do the disassembly or dismantling systems look like right now? Um, and, and what enhancements are really needed to make the, the supply base for these critical materials actually efficient, uh, scalable, and profitable? Well, currently, many of the, the recovery and the disassembly systems and the remanufacturing systems are distributed. Um, there's an uncertain supply of cores. Uh, so even though you have a system that might be able to uh, produce or disassemble a certain amount of, of material, uh, it is uncertain if you have the core to actually move uh, to produce that amount of material. Uh, it's traditionally small to medium enterprise focus and a lot of it is manual processes. And this limits the scalability uh, of these systems. So you're looking at uh, lower or, or smaller scales um, that really don't input a lot of supply in, into the system. Um, but a desired future system would really look at having an efficient, stable supply of cores um, so that you can, you always know that you can run your dismantling or recovery system at a certain level, buy in from small to large enterprises. Uh, so OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, salvagers, core distributors, uh, different, different key players in the system to ensure that there's a, a steady uh, flow of high quality cores coming back for dismantling and recovery. And then uh, what we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail is automated or semi-automated systems. And uh, the reason for a desired automated or semi-automated is really to increase the volume of, of dismantling, the volume of recovery, so that you can reach scales that really impact the supply of critical materials uh, and start to reach some cost efficiencies. Uh, and there's many technologies that we can do this. And, and in this webinar, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really talk about how collaborative robots can fit into this type of system. Uh, so what automation challenges really exist for disassembly and dismantling? Um, and I have a few specific examples here on the left, but I do want to start here on the right uh, at this top figure, where I uh, will say traditional forward manufacturing operations are here in this gray box. Uh, and they have a lot of control over how their suppliers deliver products to their operations. Um, based on contracts with suppliers, um, they're able to, to at least have a little bit of influence over the quality, uh, the timing of when those products are delivered, and the amount that those products are delivered. Uh, if we look at recovering operations, though, uh, we're really looking at taking back or getting used products from core distributors or consumers. 
And we're seeing a lot more, more a lot more players in the field uh, that give back or that are able to um, send products back to recovery operations, which means we see a lot more variability. Uh, and there's variability not just in where the supply comes from, but also in the supply itself. Um, because what uh, the different electric machines producers, they have different models, um, even though the material that you want to collect, the critical materials are in each of those electric machines, they may have different fasteners. There may be different material or material accessibility. You may have to do a different sequence of operations to access that material. And depending on the wear or even the design of the electric machine or the component, you may have different forces or torques or, or operations that you actually have to do to, re, to for fasten removal and to access those materials. So one of the major challenges is this variability of incoming core or the end of use parts or products or assemblies in terms of what condition, what type and what design. Um, now that would be at one point in time. Uh, this also applies as you look forward five or 10 years when models start to change, uh, but you do want to use the same recovery system to access those critical materials. So how do the challenges manifest in the barriers for automation? Um, and I'll start at the top and then proceed down, down this list. And the first one is a lack of product data. Uh, and this is for a, a couple of reasons. As new product models come out, they may change the location of fasteners or the types of fasteners that you need to remove to access the materials. Uh, and if there's a lack of communication, uh, which typically there is, between original equipment manufacturers and recoverers or salvagers. You have limited testing and troubleshooting time between the supply coming in and being uh, wanting to disassemble or dismantle those, those products. Um, it means that flexibility is critical. Um, which typically means a reduction in volume or scale. Um, and this is kind of two trade-offs uh, that we'd like to, to have. Uh, both is flexibility in dismantling and recovering material from certain products, but also increasing the volume of scale. Need for unique automation commands um, coming from different product data um, or how to reuse existing commands uh, or existing processes from disassembling past parts and how you can match that up with new components coming in that require unique uh, dismantling operations to access those materials. And then really decision-making processes based on the exact model and the product designs. Um, and really that's a, a function of what's coming into the recovery system or to the dismantling system and how that controls the downstream operations. Um, and being able to be agile in terms of, of what's coming into your system and how you can change, change your dismantling system to address products coming in. So the solution that's investigated by Wayne State to address some of this flexibility and the, the barriers in automation uh, is collaborative robots. And I'm gonna spend a few slides here talking about collaborative robots in general. Um, I wanna give a little bit of a background on them because they have a lot of different uses, um, not just in the one case that I'll talk about in a few slides, um, but in different manufacturing enterprises and in different research labs, um, both to execute research experiments um, and to perform research with human subjects. So what is a collaborative robot or what's known as a, a cobot uh, in, in some cases? Um, it's capable of learning multiple tasks designed to assist and work alongside human, human operators. Um, and they're really designed uh, to remove some of the, the barriers that typically exist between humans and traditional robots. Um, and they're designed that way to try to exploit the flexibility or creativity of a human with the productivity and um, repeatability of a robot. I have on the screen here, three different types of cobots, if uh, anybody's unfamiliar with them or if you haven't seen a cobot. This is a KUKA cobot. This is a FANUC, uh, the newer model of a FANUC collaborative robot. And then here's a UR5E collaborative robot. Uh, there's many different models of these, but the typical features that they have are a safety monitored stop um, so that it doesn't um, injure a person by running into them. Uh, it'll have an automatic stop if they feel a, a force or feel a resistance. Hand guided so that an operator can actually hang on to the end effector uh, and move the, the, the cobot in places where they would like uh, to either program the robot or to assist in the operation. Limited speed and unlimited payload capability. And that comes from all the safety features that are included in the collaborative robot. And then power and force control and sense. Uh, and this is also part of the, the safety features so that it can stop when it senses that maybe there's a collision happening with a person um, or someone's in, in the space that it is. So how does it compare to a traditional robot uh, in terms of performance or operations? 
So on the left column here, we have a, a cobot and some of the characteristics in terms of, of actually integrating them into systems. And then on the right, we have an industrial robot. So industrial robot is usually large batches, a little variability in operations. Cobots are looking at more low volume or high mix um, or, or operations that uh, uh, aren't as, uh, as value assembly, small assembly operations, pick and place operations. Cobot has fast and easy deployment, so they're, uh, they're easily moved around a facility or around a lab, um, and then you can operate them and set them up, program them, and get them going relatively quickly. Industrial robot is usually stationary as complex deployment requiring programming offline. Uh, the Cobot can adapt to the environment, whereas industrial robot typically requires a constant environment. Lower speed and payloads for a Cobot, higher speed and payload for industrial robot, safe and human friendly, Industrial robot requires fences or some stop systems. Cobots are relatively inexpensive compared to traditional robots, uh, looking at anywhere starting at $30,000 uh, for one that you could, um, a five kilogram payload that you could move around pretty easily. Whereas the industrial robots usually require a significant investment, uh, both in terms of the robot and the system and, and the environment that the robot operates. So really the, the collaborative robot is transitioning uh, kind of how, how robots exist to or coexist in an environment to collaboration. Um, and it really hinges on shared tasks and workspaces. So um, you could say just removing the fences. If you've seen a facility with robots behind fences, um, some of the first steps with collaborative robots are to remove the fences, gain access to that space and share workspaces with humans. Collision detection to avoid you know, injury to the human a requirement once you start removing those fences. And then getting to more advanced areas of coordinating actions and intentions. So what is the intention of a human and having the collaborative robot respond to that intention. Um, so it's almost predicting what the human's going to do um, in order to um, symbiotic, symbiotically work with the human in, a, in an environment. An act of learning. Um, and, and I will demonstrate or show a little bit of this uh, later on in our results, which is um, the, the collab robot as a measurement device to learn how the human's operating or to learn how the human actually um, behaves. And that's not just for maybe uh, interpreting or predicting the intention of a human, but monitoring their performance or fatigue or, or how they're performing in operation. So a sample of current uh, industry applications for uh, collaborative robots. Uh, there's still quite a bit of interest in integrating collaborative robots and a lot of question marks in terms of what are the best processes uh, for collaborative robots. But we have a KUKA robot in the top left, the BMW assembly line, uh, screw driving at a Bentley factory, um, a cobot for polishing and finishing, uh, deburring and polishing unit here, uh, even for wall construction and masonry and then material handling to improve some ergonomics. Um, so this would be maybe an assisted material handling uh, process uh, to reduce some load on the human. So uh, after that primer of COBOT, so a short summary, um, where does it fit into the dismantling operations? Um, well, COBOT's one of the traits or characteristics that uh, are intended with COBOT's is flexibility. And that responds nicely to the need for flexibility in dismantling systems to address the variability of products that come into or that flow into your recovery uh, enterprise or recovery system. So we see, uh, I want to say two ways uh, for COBOS to fit into dismantling. Uh, one is a task assistant. So actually setting up a collaborative, a human collaborative robot dismantling station uh, to where they're repeating similar uh, tasks uh, that maybe have slight variation. So the human can handle the variation and then the, the COBOT makes it more efficient. Or as a teaching tool, um, and this is where we can interpret how to disassemble a product or disassemble a part coming in to access a certain material or a critical material, and then uh, reprogram or send that information to a larger scale line. Uh, and this is where some of Wayne State focused uh, its initial work on this project, um, which was how do we extract or how do we use this cobot to really learn how to disassemble a part, and then how can that improve a larger scale line. Um, so that's what we aim to test uh, with, with our work on FA 3.3.11. This was led by Oak Ridge National Lab, um, where they're looking to develop a high volume automated line for recovering critical materials from electric machines and other assemblies. Um, now, Wayne State was under that project and we were tasked and uh, we aim to focus to see how cobots could improve the efficiency of this larger line. 
So we undertook developing a collaborative robot test bench uh, and doing initial testing and evaluation to determine what processes, what dismantling processes might be more efficient with a collaborative robot, uh, and then how a collaborative robot might be used to learn or capture dismantling information that then could be translated to a larger scale model. So what we really aim to do was see how we could incorporate these humans in the loop uh, between new core supply coming in and the dismantling planning and dismantling operations. Um, and I'm going to dive deeper into the actual uh, training platform or the training workstation where a human and a collaborative robot um, work together to train a large value line. And that uses the human judgment in terms of what parts they're seeing in a, in a product for dismantling, uh, the separate actions for dismantling, and then recording those motions uh, and that data with the collaborative robot in order to uh, determine uh, relatively quickly what processes are required for dismantling and then where that, that information can be sent in the large scale, uh, large, uh, large scale dismantling line. So it's really to train and adapt the process quicker. That was our aim. So stage one of this development, um, and I'm gonna go through two stages uh, up to our, our current work and results, was to develop a, a first a digital twin to do this virtually. Um, both from the collaborative robot side and from the large, uh, large volume dismantling line. Uh, so we developed a digital twin in, in visual components, which is an automation, um, in, industrial automation software. Um, we replicated a large volume dismantling line uh, shown here, and then we developed a cobot dismantling learning station, as you see in this figure. So this is the human um, that would collaboratively by, collaboratively by hanging on to the end effector of this UR5E robot, dismantle this part. And as the dismantling happened, the cobot would be recording the data and then translating that data from trajectories and motions into disassembly information and disassembly tasks that then the large volume line would in, intend to, to perform. So we had virtual collaborative dismantling. We simulated the human and the cobot movements first and then started research on development of approach to extract the dismantling operations. Uh, so really to go from the code or the, the um, positions of the cobot to our dismantling processes and tasks. Um, and that concept was really to facilitate an agile dismantling line. So for every new assembly or new product model that came in that needed to be dismantled to access the materials, the operator, that uh, product would be sent to the station and the operator with the cobot uh, would dismantle the product. The cobot would record the, the movement and then that would be sent to a central location that then the automated disassembly line could access um, for the large volume robots to, uh, to learn from and to, to perform the operations uh, at a scale not achievable with the collaborative robots. Uh, in attempt to, in a, in a, in intended to um, really shorten the time between when new models come in and when they can start being fed to the system to start extracting the materials. Uh, so the, the approach would be first the human to cobot. So this is where the dism, dismantling trajectory is extracted. Uh, the sequence and the operations are recorded at a station here. Uh, and then the second is the cobot to the digital twin um, or where the cobot would then um, translate the data into disassembly motions, disassembly tasks, and that would be stored in this digital twin here. And, and then the, the digital twin uh, can be used for simulations. If you have different schedules coming in or you want to uh, simulate to see what sort of volume you could output from the line, um, but also the, the large scale automated line would then be able to access this digital twin to pull the disassembly instructions and disassembly tasks um, for a specific part. So if R1 robot one knew that a certain model was coming in, it could automatically uh, determine and extract what motion R1 had to perform to do the dismantling of that product. And that could rapidly change for a different product. So if R1 was dismantling four or five different product models in a day, it could immediately access those programs that were developed by the COBOT training station. So this is what the entire system looked like. Uh, and Wayne State, we started to work on the, the first pieces of this, which was how do we really extract the disassembly information from the COBOT training station. Uh, that would be the first step into executing this system. Um, and it's a, it's a non-trivial task because what you're collecting from the COBOT is just trajectories. Uh, so we really need to, we had to develop a way to um, input the human judgment side into that. 
and then to determine how these trajectories really translated into disassembling motions. So that was our first task um, that, that we decided uh, that we were pursuing, both from the virtual side and then in the next two slides, I'll get into the, the actual experimental side, it was translate, translating this motion and identifying the dismantling actions. Um, so we, we started with two dismantling operations, a pick and place, so removing a part or a component from a, an assembly, and then unscrewing, so a typical fastener. Um, and so this was formulated as three point locations and one human variable, so the human variable would be able to tell um, when the pick and place occurred and when it ended, so we knew that that was a disassembly task. And then all the locations in between that, um, that input from the human would tell us the, the motions that had to be done to do the dismantling action. So gripping approach and retraction um, and what rotational movements or if we didn't have any rotational movements, which you wouldn't have with a pick and place. And then on unscrewing, we had a three point locations and one variable, uh, which was the human indicating that a disassembly task was happening. Uh, and then again, all the points in between, all the trajectories in between uh, uh, the human indicating a disassembly task was happening uh, would determine the trajectories that we would have to do to use to develop the, the actual disassembly processes or dismantling processes. So this would be non-rotational in this case during our initial developments. Uh, and so I'm not gonna dive into detail on, on what these variables are too much, but we'd have some uh, output data from this cobot and human uh, dismantling operation represented by S. And then from that overall data, um, we could determine the direction and the displacement and the vectors matrices is M and D. And then from there, we can convert them to the actual um, trajectories required for disassembly and classify what disassembly action was taking place. So at the end, what we wanted to, what our objective to get in this first task was to say, um, here we did dismantling with a cobot and human. These are the disassembly or dismantling tasks that were done. And these are the motions that need to be followed to do that. And with that basic disassembly or dismantling information, we could translate it to large volume robots uh, so that they knew what motions to do when a certain part came to them. So that was stage one was the virtual side. Um, and while we were developing that, that simulation, uh, we were also developing a, a physical test bench with a, a collaborative robot, the universal robot 5 e um, And our aim after the virtual side was to um, replicate these experiments using uh, an actual person. Uh, and then record the data from the cobot and apply our methodology to uh, test and evaluate what dissimilar information we could really learn. So uh, this was a physical operator and the cobot. Uh, we had subroutines and, and main routines from the disassembly side. And then we wanted to define what, uh, what dissimilar operations took place. So we had recorded data from the cobot in terms of uh, trajectories and XYZ uh, coordinates, rotation, speed, uh, input and output variables from the, the user in terms of when in a disassembly, when a part was started to be dismantled and then when it dismantling ended. We had then tr extracted translations of vectors for how a part was removed um, or how a part was approached. And then we transformed that actual real data um, into the dismantling task, dismantling sequence um, and the, the trajectory. So really replicating what we were um, testing out and developing virtually on a physical experiment. So in that task, we set up our, our um, UR5E dismantling workstation here. Um, this was done last spring, so a little ad hoc uh, during the, the pandemic. And we were trying to do the best we can in, in setting up a, an actual physical experiment. So this is a UR5E collaborative robot. Uh, and then we were able to 3D print a small part uh, with disassembly so that we could test out the trajectory methods and our methods for extracting the disassembly station. Um, or disassembly information. So we analyzed the unscrewing and the pick and place operations of the cobot, extracted the data from here, and then applied the methodology. Uh, and we collected uh, multiple runs, uh, and, and I'll get into why we collected multiple runs or multiple disassembly um, operations. Uh, a little bit later, we wanted to evaluate one metric, which was how consistent the human and the cobot operations were. Um, and then we divided that, um, uh, dismantling trajectories into different disassembly tasks. So here's the, the real disassembly station. Uh, and then in real time, uh, we were able to communicate with the visual component software, the movement of the cobot. So this is showing 
where the human uh, moved the cobot during this dismantling operation to record all the trajectories and points. Uh, and then actually down here, this was towards the end uh, of the work, we were able to extend um, the positions and the, the trajectories from the UR5E to a FNAC, a FNUC robot. Uh, so translating what we learned from the cobot to what would potentially be a large volume dismantling operation. Uh, and in this, we were able to directly translate uh, the coordinates and the disassembly motions from the, what we learned on the cobot to this larger, uh, larger volume robot process here. So one slide on, on the results um, of the operation, which is mapping this physical human cobot actions to dismantling. So in the virtual side, uh, it's nice there's no uncertainty, there's no variability in the operations. Uh, and we were able to take the data generated from the cobot and human dismantling shown in this matrix here, and then determine uh, if it what disassembly action was occurring, uh, pick in place, or unscrew or screw, and then determine the trajectories. Um, now on the physical side, uh, it's a little bit more um, variable. Uh, so we wanted to evaluate that uncertainty. So we applied this methodology uh, to the data we collected from the cobot, and we were able to um, repeat it. However, because uh, you had now a human, actual human operating it, you had variability in how the human positioned the cobot and how the human uh, executed the cobot operations each time. Um, and that variability can cause issues, or what we, we predict could cause issues uh, in terms of the exact location of where you would want to send a robot arm to remove a fastener to do a dismantling operation. So in this top figure, uh, we have a, a difference between where the center of the fastener would be and where potentially the human uh, would direct the cobot to. Uh, with the human and the cobot, they might have a correction put in place just by the human. Uh, but if you sent this to a large volume and industry scale uh, type of robot, it wouldn't know how to do that correction. Um, and then there's additional variability in the angle that was approached by this fastener. So instead of coming perfectly from the top, perpendicular to the top of the fastener, uh, the human would come at a slight angle. Um, so we observed these, these variabilities. Um, and, and we were able to quantify them, um, but uh, they could cause uh, some issues in terms of where you position the actual robot. Um, however, uh, there are some potential solutions such as forecasting um, where the model came from, forecasting the position or applying some other algorithms uh, to correct these, uh, these variabilities from the humans in the cobot learning station. Um, so this is, this is where Wayne State, this is as far as we got, we were working on the project from summer 2019 to the uh, summer 2020. Um, and then the project is no longer going on. So we, we made it about this far to where we developed our, our cobot dismantling workbench uh, and we're able to initiate some results on reprogramming a large volume line uh, and making that connection between the collaborative robot learning station and the large scale dismantling line, and then also evaluating some variability um, in a human cobot uh, operation, which would be uh, contribute to if, if you're developing a cobot human dismantling station uh, within the larger volume line. So performing multiple fastener removals for different products with a cobot and a human. Uh, so what we learned, um, initial results, uh, I think we indicate that cobots have potential benefits. Um, both for flexibility of a dismantling station and in capturing disassembly information uh, that can be com communicated to a larger dismantling line or a large volume dismantling line. Uh, at the current stage, uh, we, we weren't able to conclude the economic or throughput benefits. Uh, this was our, our next uh, real sort of next steps was to, uh, on the physical test bed, um, evaluate uh, the performance uh, of repeating a dis dismantling task for a specific electrical machine um, to determine the benefits of, of using a collaborative robot first in the station, uh, and then uh, testing out how we can reprogram or what we can do with the dismantling information that we learned from the collaborative uh, robot station. Uh, but we were able to develop the test bench uh, with the collaborative robot and the initial dismantling, uh, initial methods to translate the human cobot dismantling information. Um, so that, that we could proceed with this work um, if we were to go to the next steps, which would be 
Uh, first, integrating our, our virtual uh, dismantling line with our physical uh, experimental cobalt learning station. So with, um, uh, with visual components, we can have sort of a cyber physical system to where what we do in the physical uh, cobalt learning station, we can visualize and send to the simulation uh, to see how it might change uh, the actual um, dismantling. Uh, simulate for throughput and flexibility to really evaluate those metrics and then fully incorporate or address the human variability aspect. This is both from using the cobot, uh, human cobot dismantling station as, as a way to plan your dismantling operations. Uh, and then in terms of evaluating a disassembly station, uh, well, we really had the, the setup uh, to do that, but then the next step would be to select a specific operation uh, from electric machine dismantling and then fully evaluate the benefits if there's benefits of the, the collaborative robot uh, in, that, in that operation. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, Critical Materials Institute uh, and Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, it was fantastic to collaborate and work with Tim McIntyre and Jonathan Harder. Um, we, so this work is appearing in Presidia, uh, Presidia Manufacturing, not Presidia CERP, uh, from the Flexible and Automation Intelligent Manufacturing Conference, uh, which was 2020 now expected in 2021. Uh, and then really uh, acknowledge a PhD student, Joao Paroli, uh, who really spearheaded a lot of this work. Uh, so thank you. Um, I guess we'll open it up to, to, to the questions now or the question and answer um, list, Cynthia. Yes, I want to thank you first, uh, Jeremy, for such a great presentation. And um, it's, it's uh, really interesting how you, you know, outlined uh, your, your work with uh, Oak Ridge for um, the focus area three. I uh, really appreciated uh, how you immediately said the emphasis on uh, driving reuse and recycling, which perks up everybody at CMI's ears here, and then immediately made the connection onto how this would be, you know, an important, this is an important um, experiment uh, for the Critical Materials Institute, as it takes it immediately into manufacturing and industry, um, any, any results further that you might find uh, with this uh, cobot uh, effort. Um, very interesting work. Again, appreciate how you took us all the way through to the successes and then also um, next steps, which we hope that these next steps get to be accomplished because reuse and recycling is uh, really a very important part of uh, CMI's contribution um, to industry. So thank you very much. And it looks like you have a couple of questions um, ready to go. All right, I will, I will go for the first question. I'll, I'll read the name and then I'll repeat the question for any of those calling in. So forgive me if I, if I mispronounce your name. Uh, first question is by Hong Yu Jin. Um, what products or components will be ideal for cobot dismantling? Um, I, I'll answer uh, this one from a couple kind of two directions. Uh, the first one is if it's, if the cobot is integrated in the dismantling line where it's doing repeated uh, operations over and over and over again, um, then it would be lower payload products. So you couldn't do anything that's very large. Um, and you would have to have um, uh, a force or a torque that could meet the specifications of the cobot. So you're looking at maybe uh, fasteners uh, on a product that, and then after those fasteners are removed, uh, it might get sent to uh, a different machine to do the, the rest of dismantling. Uh, so because of the cobots are limited in payload uh, and speed, uh, you have to take that in consideration for different products or components of those products. Uh, so I hope I answered that question. If not, uh, please type a follow-up question um, um, in the chat. Uh, the next question uh, from Daniel um, Junusar, uh, what advantages of automated remanufacturing is needed to justify the cost of cobots? Uh, so for example, what speed is needed over human only operation? Um, again, I'll, an I'll try my best to answer this one from a couple different directions. Um, so cobots are relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can get a 30 to, if you get the larger payload ones, you're, you're looking at a lot more expensive. Something like what we had was around 30,000, but you would want a little bit more payload. Um, and so the advantages uh, in speed would be one, um, and then flexibility would be the other. And quantifying that flexibility, I think, is a, is a challenging um, or would be an interesting question to really get to, which is what we, we, we aim to do or what would be some of the next steps in the work. Um, 
for the for the speed, uh, that is also something that we we didn't get to in, in this work, but we had the workbench set up to really evaluate that. So, um, in the next in the next steps that we wanted to do with that that uh, cobot human dismantling station was pick a process um, and really quantify what what the benefit would be from the the cobot only the human only the cobot and then and then fully automated um, in terms of maybe a robot with a vision system. Um, that's doing a lot of calculations or learning to do that operation versus a human who can do it right away. And then the in-between with the human and the cobot. Um, so I, I don't have an exact number for there, um, but I know um, speed would be one and the flexibility would be something we want to evaluate as well, uh, especially with the cobot and human, if it's acting as a, a learning station to send information to the rest of the dismantling line, um, what flexibility would have there over a human dismantling the product uh, and then reprogramming the line manually, or what um, what advantages or disadvantages it might have from a fully integrated uh, line with complete vision systems everywhere. Um, so we have uh, another question, uh, Jun Liu. Um, thank you. Does Cobot use battery? If yes, what are the unmet performance of uh, the incumbent battery? Uh, as far as I know, uh, the current collaborative robots on the market do not use uh, a battery. Um, uh, they all require uh, a power uh, delivered directly to it. Um, so I, I, I don't think I'm best. There may be some. Uh, there's a lot of cobots uh, on the market from different vendors uh, and different manufacturers. So there, there might be some one that I'm not familiar with. Um, it'd be interesting to look into that. Uh, and then we have a follow-up question on the automated remanufacturing. Would automated automotive lithium ion battery be a good product for cobots? Uh, I think there's potential there for the lithium batteries, um, both in terms of a human collaborative station and then as a, a learning station to develop the, the disassembly information for how you disassemble a lithium ion battery. Uh, the core concepts of what I presented here would extend really to just about any part or any assembly. Um, it just happened that Wayne State, we were focused more on the electric machines. Um, but the, the, the structure uh, and, and the framework that we worked on could be applied to really any part to capture the disassembly information. Uh, you're welcome for answering the question. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. I see you've gotten a couple of thank yous uh, for the presentation. So if there's anybody out there still with a question that's left uh, um, remaining, um, make sure that you start typing that in. Uh, also do not hesitate to contact um, Dr. Rickley directly. And you can see that he has his uh, email posted on this very last slide. Yeah, feel free to contact me. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm happy uh, to discuss this all day. Ah. <laughs> Any last uh, parting words for the audience here? Anything else that you've been uh, uh, seeing how what this can be connected to or? Yeah, I, I well, we'll say a, a couple last words just uh, generically on collaborative robotics. Um, <clears throat> uh, myself and a collaborator at Wayne State, we're, we have another project where uh, we're working to develop learning programs to for community college community colleges to develop collaborative robotic uh, programs uh, because there is a lack of certification, a lack of, of workers with the skills to use the collaborative robots in industry. Uh, and through that work, we've had a lot of interesting conversations and we've received a, a few requests and a few questions from research laboratories on integrating collaborative robotics for their experiments or some of their operations. So there is applications for collaborative robotics, not just in the dismantling side, but uh, potentially in, in research experiments as well. Part of the reason they're getting looked at uh, from research labs is because they're relatively lower cost uh, and flexible. You don't need to have fencing. Um, you can integrate them into your lab a little bit easier. Um, and the other, the other part where I think collaborative robots are seeing a little bit of interest is in really um, as a measuring device for how humans operate or how human performs a task. Uh, so we showed a few measurements on the variability. Um, there's, uh, there's been some interest in, in using the collab robots to measure you know, how repeatable of a task are you doing or how much expertise do you have? So um, while 
we really studied their application to dismantling. Um, it was kind of a, a widespread application of collaborative robots. And I'm happy to, to answer any questions as best I can, or maybe direct you in the right question, the right area. Um, if you have an interest in the collaborative robots or think there might be an interest in another aspect of your lab or research. Great, I wanna thank you again for an excellent uh, presentation. And uh, I think you can see how, uh, how economically the advantage of using a cobalt plus the efficiency advantage of using a cobot, not cobalt, co a cobot, uh, would be uh, for uh, extracting critical materials. And um, so indeed, I hope you get to continue the work and thank you for sharing this great information. I want to thank the rest of the audience for attending. I want to remind you that the recording will be available next week at aimslab.gov slash CMI under the workforce menu. Uh, if you have a suggestion for a future webinar, please don't hesitate to get that to us. And the next webinar will be on December 9th, A New Path Forward, Using Machine Learning to Design Lignans and Predetermined Selectivity. Going to be presented by Mary Lou Perez Garcia from Ames Laboratory. And of course, as always, the details will be in critical times and at our website. Thank you again so much for attending.